In 2021, some 4.4 million women and children were trapped in trafficked for sexual slavery. 4.4 million women and girls. Listen to Mary's story. She was a promising high school student from the Nigerian state of Edo. She dreamed of going to the university. She was 16 when a woman approached her mother and offered to take her daughter to Italy to find work. Mary's family pushed her to accept the offer, to lift the family out of poverty. Mary wound up being trafficked into prostitution for three years, forced into selling her body, enduring beatings and threats at gunpoint, and forced to watch the brutal degradation, carrots violently inserted into the vaginas of even younger girls as an object lesson for what might happen if she resisted. That was Raymond Lada from his talk at Revolution Books in New York City titled The Industrialization of Sexual Exploitation and Global Capitalism, or Why Sex Work is not agency, but nightmare and degradation, and why we need revolution. Raymond Lada is a spokesperson for Revolution Books in New York City and a revolutionary political economist, as well as a follower of the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian. Raymond is an advocate for the new communism developed by Bob Avakian. Raymond, welcome to the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. Hey, Andy, I'm very excited to be here, especially as we mark International Women's Day. Raymond, that program that you did at Revolution Books was incredible and incredibly important. Your exposure of the scale and the scope of the industrialization of sexual exploitation and the horrors that are wrought from this tremendous degradation of women, this has been long overdue. It's a long overdue slam against the au courant rationalizations of the violence that this whole matrix that you describe does to women. And you gave a sharp polemic to shake and wake people up to the blinders of the woke justifications of this societal horror under the signboard of agency. So, Raymond, we're going to play a few of the filmed excerpts from your talk, and then we're going to have a chance to discuss and uh, hear from you about a couple of these points that you made in the presentation. And before I even begin, I want to encourage our audience, this won't be the last time you hear this from me, to go to Revolution Books' uh, website, uh, and we'll also put it up on our site to see the entire talk that Raymond gives. So I want to start with two short excerpts, Raymond, from your talk. The commercial sexual exploitation of women and of young girls and boys has reached massive proportions. What is euphemistically referred to as the global sex industry has evolved into a massive profitable component of individual national economies in the world and of the world imperialist economy as a whole. The sex industry encompasses brothel, street, escort and client-based transactional prostitution, strip clubs and massage parlors, pornography, military prostitution, global sex tourism, and the unspeakable horror of sex trafficking. Yes, sex work is work. And to be clear, prostitutes, sex workers, should not be criminalized, persecuted, and abused. They're human beings whose humanity, as is the case for all women, is denied, devalued, and endangered. But let's also be clear that sex work is not just work. It is the female body for sale, on offer, for social, excuse me, for sexual control, domination, and degradation. Whether non-consensual or consensual, 
This activity represents the extreme commodification and objectification of the female body. So, Raymond, could you paint more of a picture of what you rightly say is euphemistically referred to as the global sex industry? Yeah, Andy. Um, in short, it is mammoth. It is integrally entwined with the workings of the world imperialist economy. And it is a horror. You know, um, there are approximately 42 to 45 million prostitutes in the world. 80% of them are women. Most are 13 to 25 years of age. Most are beholden to pimps. And most of these women do not want to be doing this. So that's one level of metric. Second, you know, we can consider countries like the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and their sexual commerce, the sex industry, commercial sexual exploitation, accounts for anywhere between 2 to 14% of the economic activity of these countries. And in the early 1990s, there were some 200,000 to 800,000 prostitutes, again, overwhelmingly women, in Thailand who were under 18 years of age. What kind of life, what kind of future for these young girls and young women? This is the reality of what we're talking about. And, you know, it is immensely profitable um, in the mid 2010s, um, now we're talking about sexual trafficking, the trafficking in women, sexual slavery that generated annually some one hundred billion dollars in revenues. That's more than the combined profits of Nike and Starbucks, Google. And Microsoft, that's the immensity of what we're talking about. And it is this horror. Raymond, the scale and scope of what you've just presented and is in your talk that people should really listen to the whole thing is, 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 is just, it's shocking. And then you combine that with the story you told of Mary and multiply that by the numbers you've just spoken. And it's, it's really uh, horrifying. After that section of the talk, however, you went into the question of the relationship between people's individual experience and societal trends and the controversial matter of choices. Let's watch what you said. I come to my second point of analysis and controversy. One might choose to be a sex worker, but you don't get to choose the choices. The fact that people might choose to become a sex worker does not change the nature of prostitution. Yes, this could be a choice that an unemployed, poorly paid woman might make, an unemployed or poorly paid woman might make in order to feed her children. Or it could be the choice of an upper middle class graduate student to maximize her income, and her study time. Or it could be a choice that a trans person kicked out of a family or denied work might make in order to survive and seek some kind of affirmation. But all this is an indictment of a system based on exploitation, profit, and gender oppression. Why is dealing drugs or joining gangs or going into the U.S. imperialist military part of the narrow range of choices that this system offers poor black and brown youth. The choices people confront flow from the nature of this system. Let me repeat that. The choices that people confront flow from the nature of this economic social system of capitalism imperialism. But Individual choices also have social effect and consequence. A woman might choose to produce 
or participate in pornography, and it might involve consensual sex. But pornography has a social effect. It shapes the outlook of young boys and men in general, and women as well, as to what is acceptable, expected, indeed valued in the realm of sexual relations. Let me put it more starkly. Back in 2011, members of a Yale fraternity gathered in front of the Yale Women's Center holding placards and chanting, no means yes, yes means anal. Boys and men are socialized sexually by pornography. It is a primary source of information about sex for young people, and young men are habituated to regard the depiction of sex in pornographic film and other media as realistic. So the individual choice to engage in pornography has real social effect. And by the way, in that same survey I cited, it's a 2022 survey of the sadness and depression affecting teenage girls in the U.S., one in seven of those teenage girls said that they experienced forced sex as teenagers already. Now, there are those who defend sex work as the exercise of bodily autonomy, the right to do with one's body as one desires. And some people have written revolution books or emailed us that there's a uh, contradiction to say that you uphold the right of a woman to control her reproductive choices and destinies, yet oppose bodily autonomy when it comes to sex work. But again, we have to look at the social content of rights and whether they harm or benefit society from the standpoint of the well-being of society and the struggle to end oppression. Women's right to abortion is vital to the emancipation of women, to their ability to participate fully and equally in society, because forced motherhood is female enslavement. But when a right-wing fanatic says, no one can tell me to get a vaccine, it's my body, this anti-scientific individualism damages the well-being of society. Raymond, this is tremendously important, bringing to life and bringing to bear a critical understanding that Bob Avakian has been stressing now for a number of years that pulls back the lens on how, the continue, how this system continually generates choices for masses of people that keeps them and humanity trapped within the killing confines of the world as it is, blinding them to what the world could be and what is in the interests of humanity. It's my, uh, I watched the uh, talk on, uh, you know, on um, the, the, the uh, live stream of it, and I noted that this point kicked off a principled controversy in a discussion in the Q&A. Would you share some of that with the RNL audience? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, no sooner had I finished my talk, Andy, than um, a woman jumped up from the audience and uh, she identified herself as a former prostitute, sex worker, and someone who had appeared in uh, pornographic films. And she said, look, I completely disagree with you. Um, this uh, was a conscious decision I had made. This was, you know, several years back. I uh, was a sex worker prostitute for 20 years and I made some 20 pornographic films, my decision, and I found it utterly rewarding and fulfilling. And uh, what you're telling me is uh, is not right. It doesn't square with my experience. And uh, no sooner had she finished that comment than someone in the audience, Jim Farad, um, a veteran of the gay liberation movement and a uh, radical activist and thinker, he responded to her and he said, look, I don't doubt the uh, sincerity of what you're saying and how you might have uh, felt about this, but this is a minuscule slice of experience of this big social phenomenon of the global sex trade, of global sex exploitation. And what's the essential character of this? 
you know, the exploitative, degrading, you know, ways in which people are forced, you know, to throw themselves into this, the psychological and the physical hurt that it brings with it, the the degradation. And this, uh, Andy, I have to say, opened up a really important discussion and debate in the audience about the relationship between individual experience and a larger social reality, which in this case is, um, you know, the global sex industry, prostitution, sex work. And what is the essence of this? What does it actually involve? What does it do to people? What does it require of people? And, um, you know, we got into it. And it, the question of choice is is one that, as you pointed to, you know, Bob Avakian has been emphasizing has to be seen in the societal context. Now, People may feel that they're choosing to be a sex worker, but there is economic compulsion that's involved in the majority of cases. People are forced to do this, you know, to feed families, to pay rent. And then there's also what appears to be choice is the internalization of the values of the system. And this, too, is masked. You know, because people are so inculcated with those values. So what is objectification of the female body is taken to be self-objectivization, self-commodification of the female body by those who rationalize this. I am making this decision to market my body, to market my sexuality. So now it's self-degradation and that becomes agency and that becomes empowerment and this is how you know you have you know what's going on right now where the dominant i have to say the dominant understanding of uh, prostitution of sex work is that this is the conscious choice that people are making and again you know here we are people are locked into the immediacy of their individual experience and that becomes the arbiter of what is the underlying character of this when in fact when you pull the lens back as we've described you see you know what this means to women's bodies to women's psyches and how it degrades and now this becomes conscious choice when in fact it's a function of the patriarchal relations in society and what happens is that this now limits people's sense of possibility that their individual immediate lived experience and woke thought, woke politics, prioritize the immediate lived experience of people. And that becomes the boundary of understanding. And that becomes the boundary of possibility for change. And this was something that we were really you know, thrashing out in this discussion. It was a very exciting debate that took place. Well, Raymond, also just before, I want to go into this question a a bit more about how people think about the problems that they face and how they, their solutions. But first, I think, you know, I'd like to just put a little more of what, uh, what does this mean for how, if, if, for every woman, in other words, there's the question here of, the, of, of those who see this as their agency, but there's a question here of the broader way that women perceive themselves in society, which you just spoke to, and how even people have to worry about going home from the dorm at night for students, walking home from work if you're working second shift, and, and, and how this conditions... Uh, both how women view themselves, but it conditions a lot how men view women. And that's created a a really horrific situation. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about patriarchy, and that involves, you know, the sense of male entitlement, you know, the right to the female body, the right to dominate, you know, the right, you know, to insist that women, you know, satisfy their sexual needs and are at their service, at their beck and call. And women are then expected, you know, to uh, promote themselves, to market themselves, to brand themselves, to present themselves 
in the market of human relationships, yes, human relationships become marketized and monetized, and the female body and female subordination to men is how this society functions, that the female body on offer, that is, it's prostitute, and the female body that must be the source of titillation to men. And, you know, you talk about, um, you know, we talk about, you know, the pornography industry, and you played a clip earlier from, you know, my talk about how this socializes young boys and men into how they are to carry out sexual relations with women and with other men, you know, in a society in which patriarchy and, you know, the dominance of male over female is what defines sexual relationships of all genders. This is what becomes internalized. So this is how this all impacts women, impacts men, and it really poisons relationships, you know, on a massive scale. And it's a sense of sexual entitlement that men have. And it's a sense that women have to cater to sexual whims of men. And as I said, you know, put themselves on offer in the marketplace of human relationships. You mentioned, though, um, you know, uh, the woke framework and what we've come to call uh, this woke idiocy that's uh, come to dominate in straitjacket, how people think about the problems that they personally face and which people as a whole face. And so many young women and girls, as well as boys and men, as you said, think that they in the world can't change, that all these social relations are are fixed. And, you know, with particularly with young girls, they take it out on themselves and young girls and young boys take it out on each other. And so the question gets posed that people can't think of a different way we could be, and they also don't think that they can change. It's just something innate in them. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, yeah, I think, as I said right, earlier... Because it also came up uh, in the, in the, in the Q&A. That's one of the... Yeah, right. I mean, um, it was a, a, very, a, a very rich discussion that we had. Yeah, what happens is that people become locked into the choices that the system puts before them. And they see their agency as being the ability to choose among those pre-existing choices. So you are kind of circumscribed by that. And, um, you know, it leads to a sense that nothing can change, you know, that people can't change, that men can't change, that society can't change. That w- what we have to do is kind of navigate within this preset selection of choices and make the most of that. And that includes degrading oneself. You know, it includes, you know, imposing all kinds of constraints on your own ability, you know, to be more than what this society wants you to be. And you're locked into that, as I said. And, you know, this was a big question that took you know, that took hold in the uh, program at the store about whether people can change. And I have to say, there were some people in the audience, the women especially, who are pointing to some of the men in the room who were, you know, progressive, radical, revolutionary minded, and how refreshing it was to see men talk about this question in this open minded way and condemning this horror, you know, forthrightly. And I, in one of the most poignant moments of the discussion, uh, there was a, a young woman who got up and she began addressing this question of male right and the demand, you know, for sexual subservience uh, and uh, on the part of women to male whim and desire as defined by society. And um, she talked very, very openly about how she and her boyfriend, you know, were grappling with, wrestling with the harm that pornography causes in their relationship. They are consumers of pornography. And she talked about how both together and separately they were thinking about how this depiction of women and what is uh, expected sexual relationships Uh, in this society, really desensitized both of them. 
to the objectification of women. I mean, this was really a very remarkable um, sort of exchange that took place. And then she said that she and her boyfriend, you know, were kind of talking this out and they decided that they had to stop consuming pornography, that it was really damaging of their relationship. And then, you know, she remarked to the audience, she said, you know, we went through this and we kind of, and this is her phrase, released ourselves from this kind of thinking and relatively quickly. So, you know, I I think, you know, it, it, it talks about, you know, rather, it bespeaks, you know, the fact that people can change. And, you know, we saw big galvanic changes in the 1960s with the upsurges of the black liberation struggle, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, you know, where people began to reexamine, to critically examine the relations in society, interpersonal relations and people's values and the ethos changed. And this was a big question that was on the table. Can people change? How can people change? What provides the most favorable conditions for major change in terms of upsurges, uh, rebellion, big societal movements that call into question the ways that society functions? And of course, the most fundamental, the most radical change which is revolution, which opens up whole new possibilities. Well, I, I, I just want to say that, uh, and follow up on that comment, that we're going to close with the, your fourth point in your talk that was titled, We Don't Have to Live This Way. And this is the heart of what the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show and Revolution Books in Harlem and Berkeley and the Revcoms are all about based on the vision and leadership uh, of Bob Avakian. So uh, this provides, I think, a, a, a fitting introduction to our next se- segment of the show uh, today on International Women's Day, but it also is an important conclusion to this uh, segment. And uh While we've played some, uh, and we'll play his conclusion, his point four in a second, on today's show, I do once again want to commend to our audience, it really repays watching this presentation that Raymond gave, as well as the discussion that followed it. There's a lot to learn from it, and there's a whole other way of looking at these questions, and not just accepting everything is fixed, uh, you know, and that this is what it, this is how we have to be. So, Raymond, uh, uh, just congratulations on a great presentation and program, and I want to thank you for being on the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show once again. Well, thanks for having me, and I look forward to coming back. Okay, so now we're going to play this part four from Raymond's uh, talk at Revolution Books. We don't have to live this way. And then we're going to go right to our segment on International Women's Day, and Sansara will join us again. We don't have to live this way. This, too, is part of reality. We can do far better than deluding ourselves that we can own our own oppression. We can make a revolution to overthrow this capitalist imperialist system and put an end to that oldest oppression and to all exploitation and oppression. A revolution to create a society and world where women are not on display and viewed as sexual objects, or see themselves as marketable sexual objects. Where there is full equality between women and men and differently gendered people. Where we can go to work on uprooting patriarchy and male supremacy. A total revolution that transforms the economy, the ways that people relate to each other, everything. A society that fosters sexual relations based on shared affection, mutual pleasure, and equality. The vision and blueprint for this liberatory socialist society is found in the Constitution for the new socialist republic in North America that uh, someone could uh, hold up or... Right, they put it in me. (laughs) Revolution Books is prepared. So uh, this is the Constitution for the new socialist republic in North America, that vision and blueprint 
for a liberatory socialist society. It was written by, by Baba Vakian, the leader of this revolution. The socialist economy abolishes private capitalist control over the means of producing wealth. It puts an end to the measuring rod of profit. It applies the resources of society towards meeting social need and towards the betterment of humanity. Women, men, trans people will not be forced to seek out prostitution to feed children and pay rent. The family and the primary responsibility within the family of women as principal caregivers will radically change. There'll be new living and working arrangements that break down isolation and fragmentation. The rearing of children will increasingly become the responsibility of society. Traditional gender roles will be interrogated, challenged, and transformed. Art and culture will be spawning grounds of new thinking and attitudes. It's not a fixed playbook. There will be standards and criteria furthering the emancipation of women and overcoming all oppressive divisions among people. And there will be experimentation at the same time. There will be broad debate and continuing struggle to transform society. The new state power will give backing to women and to all fighting to carry the struggle for the liberation of women forward. And within the framework of a society moving towards eliminating all exploitation and oppression and creating a world community of humanity, the new socialist society will foster unprecedented dissent and intellectual ferment. The, intro, the, in, the educational system, I'm excited by the vision, the, edu, the educational system will train people to take up the scientific method and approach to the natural and social world and to be critical thinkers. All this contributes to the ability of people to more deeply understand and profoundly change the world. Now, we are in a moment in history, a rare time, when it becomes po more possible to make this revolution that I'm talking about. And this is so, principally so because of the sharpening divisions within the U.S. ruling class and sharpening polarization in society overall. It is a highly volatile situation, and also a highly dangerous one. There is the potential for full-out fascism, and these fascist forces are rampaging throughout society, outlawing abortion, trying to prevent the teaching of black history, demonizing and wanting to quarantine trans people. There's the growing danger of world war. And there is the real possibility, the danger, of quantum leaps in the fascist program to institutionalize traditional morality and control over women, alongside the even greater expansion of the sex industry. So here you have a lethal and poisonous combination of high-tech social degradation and the enslavement combined with repressive fundamentalism. Things are coming to a head. Something terrible or something truly emancipating, as Baba Vikian has put it. A world of growing horrors or a radically different and far better world. You know, I've spent time talking about choices. So here's the question. Are you going to allow your dreams for something better to be confined to choosing the best terms of commodification within this system? Or are you going to take up the liberating cause of revolution to radically transform the choices that all humanity could have? Thank <laughs> you.